there are countless factors that can lead to your death. As senior coroner, I deal with almost 4,000 fatalities a year. Royal Preston is one of the hospitals in coroner Dr. James Adeley's jurisdiction. Every single person in this mortuary that has died unnaturally is under the control of the coroner. Dr. Adeley can make any inquiries necessary to find a cause of death. If the coroner instructs the police to investigate, then that is what we do. In this series, for the first time ever, we follow the full investigation and unfold the mystery of any unexplained death. From the moment of arrival in the mortuary to the final conclusion of the inquest. It's allowing families to understand how the death occurred and deal with it in their own way as part of their own grieving process. This is the last bit to find out what actually happened to him. If you die here, if it's violent, unnatural, or of an unknown cause, it's my job to find out how. A man has collapsed suddenly in the street. I crossed over the road, and by the time I come back over the road, he were he was on the floor. Sadly, he died shortly after arriving in hospital. It's reported he was walking down the road with a friend. He stopped to look at a car. Friends carried on walking, realised they weren't behind, gone to find him, and he's collapsed on the floor with a member of the public giving CPR. On arrival at the hospital, they deemed it a bit strange, the, the way it was presented. The man has been identified as 41-year-old Eastern European Robert Pavlov, who had lived in the UK for 10 years. We're trying to locate next of kin. His family live in Slovakia, so what will happen is I'll have to contact the embassy with the details and ask them to make contact with the family for me. We'll probably do toxicology to look at the levels of blood and drugs within his system to see if it's possibly a drugs-related death or alcohol that might have contributed in some way. It might just be a natural cause of death, but he's 41, so he's quite young. Any deaths in hospital are reviewed by the medical examiners. I was just wondering if you've got any further information with regards to the Robert Pavlov that came in from the community. Do you know if there were any medical interventions? Was anything done? I think the paramedics tried resuscitating him at the scene, um, but he was more he'd more or less died when he, he came in. Right, OK. Um, any past medical history? Um, the only thing noted on here is excess alcohol and epilepsy. OK. Any drugs? Cannabis use. Um, any intravenous? Not according no. to the okay. records. That's fine. Uh, and we'll probably put him through for CT post-mortem. Yeah, I don't think any of the doctors will be able to issue a death certificate. All sudden and unexpected deaths must be investigated by the coroner. 41-year-old is quite unusual to suddenly drop dead. The difficulty here is that we've got a sudden collapse, so you don't know whether there's a fit, there's simply a drop due to sudden interruption of a heart. Um, uh, you've really got no idea. Um, Mr Pavlov also uses um, alcohol to a slight excess and some very minor social drug use. So those are issues that you would want to know about. The coroner has authorised a post-mortem scan, which is designed to give a cause of death without the need for an invasive post-mortem. But before the scan can happen, an external examination needs to take place. When we come to do an external examination, if we are not happy with something, the injuries or the marks on the deceased don't match what's in the history from the police officers, then we will refer it straight back to the coroner. He's got two faint pink marks, largest being three centimetres. One monochromatic tattoo on his left upper arm. Old linear oblique scar, left side of abdomen, three centimetres. The 
the centre of the chest, got a diffuse pink area with um, parchment abrasion to the centre of it, obviously from CPR. With nothing suspicious found in the external examination, the mortuary technician can now take the toxicology samples as requested by the coroner's office. We take vitreous humour, which is liquid from the eye. We take urine and blood. For cases like this, what they do is they send the samples off and they'll see if there's sort of any high levels of any forms of drugs or alcohol in the system and that'll all go with the final report at the end. The ultimate reason for us doing this is to find out a cause of death to why this man has just suddenly collapsed in the street. There's a big mystery surrounding Mr Pavlov's death. At Royal Preston Hospital, Robert Pavlov is having a CT post-mortem scan to try and ascertain the cause of death. The scans are performed in the iGene scanning suite, a service provided by Lancashire County Council. Robert has a history of epilepsy and alcohol abuse. So now I'm just setting up um, a head scan. So in living patients, we usually ask them to tuck their chin down to get the head in a certain position. Obviously, we can't do that um, with a deceased patient. So we have to angle the scanner itself to the shape of the head. So now everything is set up nicely. We can just go ahead. We're going to undertake a CT post-mortem where he's scanned. However, if it's an epileptic fit, um, it's largely um, uh, an electrical disturbance in your brain, which doesn't show up. Also, if you use alcohol to excess, there are a group of alcoholics who, um, if they have stopped drinking, for some reason seem to have a metabolic abnormality and will suddenly drop dead. So at this stage, we don't know how this gentleman has died. It's been a very straightforward scan. There's not been anything that's sort of jumped out to me. But when it goes through to the radiologist, they should be able to make an analysis of the whole scan and come up with a cause of death. Robert, a Slovakian national, has no next of kin in the UK. He had previously been homeless, but had been living in supported accommodation in Preston for the past three years. So I've received a reply from the homeless shelter that's in contact with Robert. They said that they know him well and they'll provide us with as much information as we can. The police are actually meeting the staff there today, so they'll probably be able to give me a bit more information tomorrow. They've contacted his sister on Facebook, who's in Slovakia. So we'll try and get a bit more information and then we can take it from there. When I met Robert, he was part of a, a group of Eastern European men who were sleeping rough in the city, and in effect, they were totally destitute. Robert had a long-term drinking problem, which contributed to him being out on the street. He approached us for help in getting into treatment, but it was part of his life, I think. The Foxen uh, managed to secure some shared houses, and Robert was one of the first people who moved into one of those properties. And Robert did great. We managed to get him settled status in this country. He went to college and started a job, and sadly, in his second week of employment, uh, on the way to work, he collapsed and died in the street. He was a kind and caring man, and the two guys who were left in the house they're older than him, and he, he provided a lot of support for them. So they were, they're really shocked at the moment, and they're going to miss him. In the 
radiology department at Royal Preston Hospital, Robert's post-mortem CT scan results need to be analysed. It is like trying to solve a mystery. We're trying to put things together. We're trying to use all the bits of information that we are given. We have a history in which he's collapsed. No illness immediately prior to that. There's nothing in there to say that he had a convulsion at the time of collapse. So that takes me away from a, an epileptic cause. So a look at the scan. This is the cerebrum, the right side. The main thing we're looking for is blood, just to see whether there's a big sort of um, area of hemorrhage. So if there was a big bleed, it would be relatively bright. The entire brain looks completely normal. So one of the things that we look for in terms of somebody who may well have died of a cardiac death is to see whether there is any pointers towards significant coronary artery disease. And one of the stigmata that we see on a CT scan is calcification. So he's got a little tiny flap, but it's not enough for me to say, yes, that's his cause of death. With the analysis done, Dr Kearney will pass on her recommendations to the coroner. So based on the CT, there isn't really anything to find, and I am thinking about whether he should just have a limited post-mortem. I would agree with you. I think a limited post-mortem in this case is appropriate. There are occasions when we have done CT scans and invasive animal toxicology and we've still not been able to get a cause of death and those are unascertained natural causes of death. And those for family are really difficult to get the head round because they don't know what they've died from. A few miles away in Blackburn, Lancashire, Emergency services are attending the scene of an accident. A moped has collided with a car and has then hit a parked truck. The driver of the car is uninjured, but the moped rider is in a serious condition. Four, five, the current doing CPR. <laughs> Do you want me to step over? You keep going. Are you all right, yeah? Right. They just got told it was a road traffic collision and the person was trapped. We didn't know uh, any extent of any injuries at that time or anything like that. And it was only kind of, I suppose, halfway there we got a report of CPIs being performed at the scene. Do you know who he is? Is got No, nothing. The casualty initially was, was right behind the truck. And then you couldn't actually see the, the bike. The bike was further down the pavement. I think it slid straight down. And so when we got there, that's all we could initially see. James and myself, we just assisted the crews with, with CPR. That was already working on the casualty. I'm just going to grab another one. Oh, can't be five, it's half three, going with time. It was dead when we turned up. And then when we were doing CPR, we brought him back. We'd been doing it 10, 15 minutes, and he said, stop, he's come back. When he was taken away from the scene, he was alive, so you, I think you just kind of hope that he's going to be OK. The moped rider has been identified as John Paul Butland. This is a 31-year-old gentleman who was brought into the hospital where he underwent a CT scan which showed um, significant injuries to both his chest and, and abdomen and head. So he was taken to theatre where they were trying to stop the bleeding that was occurring from um, several of the injuries. But unfortunately, because his injuries were so severe, his condition deteriorated whilst he was actually on the operating table. And sadly, the doctors who were involved in the case felt that his injuries were unsurvivable. John Paul died within a few hours of being brought into hospital. The radiologist must now analyse his scans to establish a cause of death for the coroner as part of the initial stage of investigation into this case. 
because he's got multiple life-threatening injuries. Uh, he's got some air outside of the lung here, which we call a pneumothorax. He's got multiple rib fractures. This is normal spleen at the front, whereas at the back here we can't see the normal spleen because he's had some bleeding around it. In addition, he's got some major vascular injuries. This is the aorta, the main branch off the heart. And as it comes down, um, you can see there's a, a line through the middle of it. Well, this is known as an aortic dissection. So in these cases, you've got multiple injuries which are not compatible with life. And therefore, you know, it's sometimes difficult to figure out which one is going to be the one that actually causes death. However, given the vascular injuries with the aortic dissection, and the um, acute bleeding from the vessels in the liver, those would be the, the most likely cause of death. A medical cause of death has been established, and John Paul can be released to his family, but the investigation is far from over. In road traffic accidents, the police work for the coroner. They must investigate the circumstances of the accident in order for Dr. Aidley to give a final conclusion on John Paul's death. The police will produce a file of evidence from the officer who was there at the scene, from witnesses who have been spoken to, from the accident investigator, and all of this will be produced to me before the inquest. So John Paul, we're going to take care of you now. What you were getting is a full picture, or as much of a full picture as you can manage, of the actual events as they occurred, or from the evidence that's left, what could be interpreted that the person was doing at the time. In the coroner's office, Alice is working on yet another referral. I've also in the process of gathering statements from uh, family members and from the police who attended the scene. The body of a young man has been found at a property in Preston. Yeah, they No, I've just literally pulled up. So the lady's on the floor. It's her ex-partner, they've got yeah. a child together, so um, she's found it's been the record straight away. OK. Who, who else is in house at the minute? No one that's it, it's just him. Just him. The man has been identified as 31-year-old Michael Richards Hargreaves. Michael had not been on WhatsApp from the day before, so I went round and I was ringing the doorbell to get in. I thought we were going to walk in anywhere with a sleeping bed or something. And as I opened the front door, it was there. I knew it'd gone. I never, ever thought he'd do anything like that. Michael has taken his own life and is now being transferred to the mortuary at Royal Preston Hospital. There's a referral from the police with regards to a gentleman called Michael, 31-year-old male. We've then contacted the family to ascertain the circumstances, past medical history, and we then refer that through to the coroner for an external examination and then proceed for an investigation to then lead to an inquest. All suicides are referred to the coroner as they are sudden and unexpected deaths. The question always with suicide is whether or not the person intended to take their own life. It is not the same as the question why. These deaths may start as a cry for help and very rapidly become a suicide. But before the question of intent can be answered, an external examination to confirm that there are no suspicious circumstances needs to take place. OK, so this young gentleman we are doing an external examination on to identify any external markings associated with his injuries. 
So we have to do a documentation of all the uh, external features, ideally down to a, a, a millimeter in, in size. Hypostatic levido tending towards the lower limbs and some around the upper shoulders. All I keep thinking about is like, there is no answers at the minute. We're just literally getting through every day as it comes. He was always there. I'm never gonna hear off him again. I just can't believe it's happened. In terms of this case, it has a number of features that mean that it doesn't tend to be complicated. There aren't third parties obviously involved. He's been found by somebody that knows him in a situation that you would expect him to be in. But part of the reason for looking into this is to ensure that what you are finding is not just what you expect to see, that you do actually look for all the other things that may give you a clue. Some cases start off straightforward and end up really quite complicated. those pictures that you drew. That's my favourite one. He was so talented. He had a very dry but sarcastic sense of humour. He was cheeky, funny, but very, very polite. And that's what people used to say to me, isn't he polite? When I found out, I was just running around the house screaming. And then that's, I actually phoned again to see if it was, you know, you're not, you're, you're not, this is, are you, you winding me up? And then the person said, no, I've seen him. Are you sure? He, he must be breathing, he must be breathing. No, he's not. The detail on that. Yeah, I don't think I can ever let these go. He <laughs> was such a good caring brother. If I ever had any problems, I could always run with him. He'd come across like he was a macho man and quite hard, but really, he just had a soft shell. Like, he was just so loving. Like, there was nobody else like Michael. He was just so funny. We're all in shock, love. We'll get through it. We'll get through it. At Royal Preston Hospital, the coroner's team are continuing to investigate whether there are any suspicious circumstances around Michael's death. It isn't a, a particularly pleasant process that I think you have to overcome and think that you're the advocate for the, for the dead person who you're trying to find out what, what happened and make sure that uh, their family knows and that you can actually help a family. A chromatic tattoo over the volar aspect of the left lower arm. Little necklace in place, full stop. Gold colored ear stud. There's no external evidence of trauma or violence, full stop. This was uh, straightforward in terms of an external examination. Uh, there was no evidence of, of any other injuries on the body. Uh, there was no signs of uh, intervention, foul play. So I'm going to go and write some notes on this. I have to send a provisional cause of death to the coroner, uh, and they will make a decision about what to do next. John Paul Buckland traffic accident, the police are investigating the circumstances 
so they can deliver a report to the coroner. Something with the Blackman job, pressing old road, what's the cert? It looks like he's gone for an overtake outside the shell garage, and at the same time, a car's turned right into the garage, uh, and the collisions occurs, and unfortunately, John Paul's died. So I need to have a look at the footage. You've got some uh, CCTV from the garage, and then make a decision as to, to where we go from there. The police with this are both the experts in road traffic policing and in scene investigation, where a significant road traffic event has taken place. You will have a report by the senior investigating officer who will have used his resources to gather the various witness evidence from those that were present at the scene. Secondary to that, you will have an accident investigator who will analyse everything that's gone at the scene and produce a report that details the speed of the vehicle, the type of road surface, uh, whether or not the vehicle was in good repair. And once all of this is put together, the police will then send us the files. When they come and they mark up, you know, you can see physically what happened to the bike. So the bike skidded all the way down this side of the road and on the pavement. Because it's such a shock, the way that my personal mind works is that if I have some sort of logical puzzle, um, you know, pieces of the puzzle to put together, it helps me process why it happened. John Paul was 31, um, he was five years younger than me, and he still lived at home with, with mum and dad and the dog, uh, and he liked it, you know, that's, that's the way he wanted to live. You know, he had friends, family, job, pretty normal from the outside, I think, but special to those that knew him. Uh, John Paul was a, a mechanic, um, loved cars, loved working on cars, but never actually found it in himself to get his own car, but he did have his motorbike and he loved his motorbike. That was his freedom, that was his independence, uh, and, he, and he loved it for all those things that, that motorbikers love motorbiking for, you know. You expect, you know, older family members to pass away, that's the natural course of life, but you don't expect the younger members of the family, you expect you expect them to sort of come up with, with you in, in life and, you know, you all get old together. It'll just be forever missing at those, those family occasions now. There are two vehicles involved in the investigation, John Paul's moped and the Toyota Prius that he hit. John Paul has come from this direction and then he's gone for the overtake as the car is turning right into the garage there. The whole incident was captured on CCTV footage and at that point we have to decide whether to treat the driver of the vehicle involved as a suspect or a witness. The vehicle involved that's turning right into the garage has just come into shot here indicating to the right and here we see Mr. Buckland performing a, an overtake at that junction at what appears to be excessive speed, and the collision occurs between the two vehicles. Part of our decision-making process is, would a reasonable and competent driver expected to see Mr. Buckland overtaking at such a speed in such a place? My initial feeling is that I don't think they would have done. Based on this footage here, I'm going to be treating the driver as a witness rather than a suspect. Yeah, I don't think the driver would have had any chance. Good afternoon, Coroner's Office. Alice speaking. Alice, it's James Aidley. Do we have an update on the Michael Hargreaves case, please? An external examination has been conducted by Professor Dawson, um, who's confirmed that the cause of death is by hanging. OK, and what statements do we need to gather so that we're going to be ready for an inquest? 
Uh, he was currently under the GP with regards to his mental health and was uh, been taking medication. So I'll be contacting Lancashire South Cumbria Foundation Trust along with Inspire, uh, the GP, because he's had recent contact, to gather statements around his mental health and what help he was getting. OK, that's great. Thanks a lot, Alice. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey Sam, you alright? Yeah, not so bad. Lovely to see you, Yeah, you too. Nice to see you. Nice to yeah. see you. Come in. Thank you. Right, is it alright if I come see you, Of course you can. Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Do you want to follow me? Yeah, thank you. Take your time. Thank you very much. Okay. I think Michael always struggled. I always think he felt lost. He was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of four, and he was statemented, and, and I knew quite from being two that he was just hyperactive. My friend, what used to babysit, she bought him a pair of trainers that were squeaked and lit up, so we knew where he was because he'd been to the next door's garden. <laughs> climbing or under a hedge. Michael wasn't really a talker. He was very troubled. I don't think he ever recognised himself. He found it very hard with too many people around him. Chris? Who you for? No, 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 no. Who you for? Very hard, cos I haven't got any answers. We'd only been to the fairground the week before. And he were laughing. Like he does, because he had a very distinct laugh. <laughs> I wish I knew what was going through his head at that moment. I don't think I'll ever say goodbye to him. Royal Preston Hospital, Robert Pavlov, the Slovakian man who collapsed suddenly in the street, has had a limited post-mortem of the thorax area to try and determine his cause of death. The thorax contains vital organs, including the heart, major blood vessels and lungs. There's not many diseases which cause people just to drop dead and die like, like Robert did. The only thing I found of note was that one of his main coronary arteries was severely narrowed. If you look at the top, this is what it should be like all the way around. This is the normal thickness. And this area here is the area of, of, of narrowing. And this is called atherosclerosis. Once a coronary artery gets obstructed and occluded beyond 65%, the blood flow through the coronary artery is massively reduced to such an extent that the, the heart can start to behave abnormally. But there was another factor involved, though, is that toxicology was taken, and this showed a very high level of alcohol in his blood, but I believe it wasn't uh, the main cause of death. People walking around with, with blockages like this in their coronary arteries can, can die suddenly and unexpectedly in any situation. So because of the proposed cause of death, that's classed as a natural cause of death, so therefore there won't be an inquest. Where a foreign national dies um, in England or Wales, there's an international treaty that we have to let the embassy know and we will liaise with the family. Uh, in this case, the family live abroad, they don't speak English, and so consequently it's the role of the local borough council that they will organise the funeral. The council will pay for the funeral due to Robert having insufficient funds. Repatriation of his ashes to Slovakia would also need to be organised and paid for. Alice now needs to speak to the Foxton Centre, who helped provide Robert with supported accommodation. Hi, Jeff. It's Alice, coroner's officer from Preston. When I spoke to the council and talked about the funeral, yeah. He said, more than likely, he said, the funeral will take place here, you know, like a cremation, but it's, it's how we go about then getting the ashes over, whether you, you'd assist with that, getting the ashes back to yeah, Slovakia. We, we can certainly assist with that, I'm sure we can pay for that.
It's great to see so many friends of Robert here today. Many of the people we work with don't have close friends and family. And it's a testament to the man that Robert was that so many people have come along today. I'm sure we've all got our own memories of Robert. He's quite a character, but you know, we'll all carry those memories forward. I've been his best friend for a long, long time. I've seen him on his lowest and I've seen him on his highest. And he's gone from doorways to having his own place, to having a proper job, to, to just going to work that one morning. I'm definitely going to miss him and so will a lot of people. Even though he doesn't have any family here, he is our family. He might not be our blood, but he's still our family. In the John Paul Buckland traffic accident, Dr. Aidley has all the reports needed to record his final conclusion. The police have found that there is no criminal culpability or fault on anyone else's part other than John Paul. Toxicology was taken as part of the investigation. The toxicology showed that John Paul had one and a half times the drink drive limit for alcohol in his system and some cannabis. And it's well understood that these affect your ability to operate a vehicle. But the difficulty here is did it contribute to this accident, not accidents in general? In this case, he's overtaking traffic in excess of the speed limit and he doesn't note the slowing Prius that is indicating. But as soon as the Prius turns, he brakes. Consequently, I can't say if the alcohol and cannabis affected his decision-making on this occasion. Road traffic deaths are unexpected. It's everybody's worst nightmare to have a knock at the door and to find a police officer stood there, because then it's just a question of who. So inquests might provide an explanation to a family as to how their loved one has died. It's not going to bring them back. It's not going to ever remove the grief and the loss that they have sustained. The blue light services and the NHS and police were, were all just amazing. There's a lot of talk about our frontline warriors, that kind of thing, but we've really experienced that on a deeply personal level for John Paul. Sometimes I feel like I see him more often on the streets now than I did before, which is so strange, um, which makes me think about him more than I did before, you know. Um, but I do miss him. Yeah, we all miss him. It's the day of Michael's inquest. Inquests are usually unfamiliar territory for those coming. It's a fact-finding investigation. It can give a family a sense of finality around the death, that they understand how the death occurred understand what has happened and um, deal with it in their own way as part of their own grieving process. It's going to be hard today. As weeks have gone on, it's got harder. I am struggling to come to terms with it. And I just think, why have you done it? But hopefully I might get some closure today. That's what I want, some closure. So the inquest today is being heard by Dr James Aidley. He's the senior coroner for Lancashire and Blackburn with Darwin. If at any point 
it's too uncomfortable and you're not happy, I'm sat right in front of the coroner. You just give me the nod, let me know, or you explain to the coroner, can you have a moment and we can always break off. All right, but I'm gonna get you up in court. The question why is very open-ended. Um, you are answering the question here, how did they come by their death? So what you are looking at is not why did they take their own life, but did they intend to do so? Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming, and I appreciate that there are a great number of you in court, which shows how much Michael was loved and missed. The GP saw Michael for a face-to-face -face consultation at his surgery on the 2nd of November, and Michael said he'd been suffering from depression and anxiety for several years. The general practitioner specifically asked Michael if he had any thoughts of suicide, and Michael denied such thoughts or plans, but when asked, went on to say that he'd had overwhelming thoughts every day that life possibly was not worth living, and he'd been referred to the mental health teams in the past, but not attended these appointments. The GP made a number of treatment decisions. The first was to place him on a type of antidepressant. Furthermore, he made a referral to the mental health services on the next day. But quite obviously, things had spiralled in Michael's mind, and he's become upset, and in that very short instance, he intends to take his own life and has succeeded. And so very sadly, I conclude that Michael took his own life, and that will be the conclusion of the court. Obviously, Michael was struggling with his mental health, but he hid it well. So he must have been living in hell. I don't think he wanted to show any weaknesses. He did get help, ish, but didn't give it time to work. Men don't talk about how they feel or what's going on. You never see him cry, get upset. Whatever someone chucks at him, he'd get on and do it. I blamed myself. Gone through a stage of hating myself. I thought, have I not done enough? I should have I'd say, you're coming home. Thank you. It's been a week since Robert Pavlov's funeral, and Jeff has collected his ashes ready for repatriation. This weekend, I'm going to fly out with the ashes myself. That seemed a, a more personal way of doing it than sending them by courier. Many of the people we work with are separated from family and friends, so we try and involve family, even if they've not been close to each other for a while, and, and bring things to a proper conclusion. I, I obviously had to contact uh, Martina, Robert's sister, uh, when he passed away, so that was a big shock to her, and I think that the fact that we're taking the trouble to take his ashes back to her, uh, and the family over there can grieve, and and, you know, organise a proper memorial for, for Robert back in Slovakia is a, is a really positive thing for them. I think she's so grateful that we're taking the trouble to do it, so that feels good from our point of view.